Testing, testing, one, two, three. Hello and welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Give yourselves a hand for a wonderful conference so far. We are live. Hello, my name is Kino Sadler, and I'm the Vice President of Programs for Echoing Green, and I am honored as an Atlantan, as an Echoing Green Fellow, as many things to be standing here today. This is a humbling day for me. Uh, my 1997 fellowship was with the Breakthrough Atlanta program, and we just celebrated our 20th anniversary a few months ago. And, and I mention that because Atlanta's been so good to me. And when I joined Echo and Green, one of the first things I wanted to do is partner with a dream that many of my Atlanta fellows have always had, and that's to bring Echo and Green resources back home to Atlanta. And so I'm so glad to be here today and to have experienced my Echo and Green family and my Atlanta family coming together. So please give yourselves a hand again. I always like to know who's in the room, so can all of the fellows please stand? Let's give them a hand. At the end of the program, you'll have a chance to interact with them and mingle with them, get their autographs, do whatever you like, so I, I highly recommend you do that. Can anyone who is a current applicant for Echo and Green please stand? Anyone who's currently in the application process? There you go. Y'all are strategic, I understand. You, you applied, you heard we're here, you come to town. That's what you're supposed to do. I'm glad you're here, absolutely. Uh, can any of those who are part of the funding community please stand? Don't be shy. <laughs> you are our partners. None of this will happen without you, so I thank you in advance for continuing to support our effort and the effort of our fellows. Thank you so very much. Can the board of Echoing Green, any board members, please stand? <laughs> your leadership and your guidance is always appreciated. Can the Echoing Green staff please stand? There you go. None of this would happen without you, and I'm honored, and you guys know I mean this. I'm honored to work next to you every single day. Can Cheryl Dorsey please stand? <laughs> yes, please. Cheryl Dorsey, please stand. <laughs> well, she's my boss, so I can't make her stand, but everyone knows who she is. <laughs> Cheryl, for 15 years, you have molded hundreds of fellows, and you've shaped this program to be what it is today. So thank you for all that you've done as well. Thank you. And can all of our pipeline partners please stand? Let me define pipeline partner. <laughs> if you are a college representative or someone who represents the type uh, access to the network that we're trying to have access to for our future fellows, please stand. So if you're part of a college, university, please stand. <laughs> While you continue standing, if you are a fellow, you're also a pipeline partner because you know the, what a fellow looks like. And so we rely on you to help us get the word out and help us select. So you please stand as well. All the fellows. 
Even our current applicant, you also know you're going through the process, so help. So when we start again, we rely on you to continue promoting it. Please stand. And all of the um, funders, any single person in this room, actually, please stand. <laughs> Let me just cut to the chase. <laughs> we rely. We rely on all of you to help get the word out. This is the day that we're building the Atlanta community. So give yourself the hand one more time. <laughs> normally, this is what we call an info session. So normally at this time, my talking points would include an introduction to Echoing Green, almost 30 years old. And over that time, we have invested $42 million in over 720 fellows who've gone out to shape this world. We have represented over 75 countries in 39 states. Normally at this time, I would also talk, start talking about the fellowship program and how we intentionally go out into this world to search. And I like to pause and, and highlight that. We are intentional in cultivating relationships in the communities that we want representation. Then we have a selection process. Then we have a two-year ongoing support. And upon that, we graduate them into this broader community. I would normally then, and I'll talk about that later. We also would talk about the broader community and how once you're a fellow, you're always a fellow. I'm a 20-year-old fellow, Cheryl's a little bit older, I won't say how much older, and how we are always part of this community through programs such as Impact Investing, which helps us get that follow-on funding and helps those fellows continue to develop their programs. Programs like Direct Impact, which provides access to board members, which is key for the program's continued success provide access to communities of practice, which are those affinities groups that allow smaller groups of fellows to continue working on those issue areas that are important to them. And of course, larger gatherings such as this, but I'll talk about that later. This day, we wanted to do something different. We could talk about Echo and Green, and we will, but we also want you to experience Echo and Green through something that we call Upstart Plus. When I got to the office, one of the things that inspired me the most was the chance to have our fellows come into the space and talk about the work that they do. And we wanted to provide that opportunity for you as well. And so this day, we have Laura Weidman Powers, one of our 2013 fellows, uh, Code 2040, and our recent Ed Cohen awardee, uh, <laughs> who's gonna come up and talk about her program, and then she's gonna be interviewed by Rohit Mah Mahotra, did I say it right? Who is the uh, founder of the Center for Civic Innovation, which is a program, I actually had a chance to, to visit his space, and uh, basically he's a little echoing green for Atlanta. He's, he's created a space for those social entrepreneurs in Atlanta to not only have access to the, a space, but also ongoing training for their ongoing uh, preparation and support. So I welcome them up, and please join me in welcoming them to the stage. everybody. What's up, Atlanta? Um, so uh, I'm going to uh, introduce myself. I'm going to give a, a little bit of a lengthy introduction just to share um, a bit about um, sort of my journey as a social entrepreneur and uh, a little bit about my organization, Code 2040, um, and then sort of where we are today. Um, so I, um, I have been working in tech as a product manager um, back in 2011 um, when I had the conversation that led to starting Code 2040. Um, it really started from a simple idea, which was that in the year 2040, people of color uh, would be the majority in the US. That's the start of the decade where this country will become majority minority. Um, and uh, I'd been working in tech, which was really felt like um, sort of the epicenter of so much of growth and innovation uh, for the economy. But when I went into work, when I went to meetups, when I sat on panels, when I looked around, I didn't see a lot of people who looked like me. I was often the only woman in the room, the only person of color in the room. Um, and the narrative at the time was that this was the case because the talent just wasn't out there. Um, and I knew from uh, 
growing up on the East Coast in a really diverse environment, um, having worked in diverse environments before, that there were plenty of talented people of color um, and talented women of color, talented women out there, um, and that it was more about a disconnect between the opportunities and the networks than it was about a lack of talent. And when we dug into the data, this turned out to be really borne out. Um, so at the time, um, and actually uh, still today, uh, almost five years later, um, the technical talent at tech companies was hovering at around um, three, four, five percent black and Latino. Um, and it turned out that 18% of computer science grads each year, each year were black and Latino. So it wasn't that there wasn't a so-called pipeline of talent to pull from, but actually that companies were not gaining access to these networks, they weren't recognizing the talent that was out there, and they weren't retaining the talent that they were pulling in. Um, so that was sort of the animating principle behind starting Code 2040, was how do we build bridges between this talent uh, that's out there and the opportunities in the sector. So we started out with the Code 2040 Fellows Program, um, which is our flagship program. It's what we're best known for. Um, we place top performing black and Latino computer science students from around the country in internships with our tech company partners. And the thing about the Fellows Program that we quickly realized while running it was that um, it was both really impactful and life-changing for the students that were going through it, but it also was an incredible learning lab and gave us a huge amount of insight and data um, that allowed us to build and grow. Um, so what we realized was that um, we were actually kind of sourcing and seeing and evaluating thousands of black and Latino CS students every year, working with dozens of tech companies and starting to understand reasons why companies were not actually able to seal the deal and make those hires. Um, and some of what allowed us to kind of enter into these conversations with companies was the fact that we had this data. Um, so if you're a company and you're hiring, um, a lot of times um, what you'll see is a false positive. If you make a hire and the person doesn't work out, you really feel that but you don't necessarily see a false negative. If you don't hire someone, and they would have been a really great fit. And what we were able to do at Code 2040 was actually see those false negatives because we knew where the students that we were introducing to companies uh, were ending up. So a company would come to us and say, um, yeah, it's really nice that you have this pool of talent, but actually um, they're not meeting our bar. And we would say, well, it's so funny that you said that because that same student that you rejected ended up at Slack or Lyft or Pandora or one of these other companies that you say are your peers. And when we were able to start kind of holding up that mirror to companies and showing them that um, when they talked about the bar, um, there actually wasn't a real bar and it wasn't about lowering the bar um, to hire more diverse talent, but actually understanding that the bar was sort of an arbitrary and ill-defined concept, that's when we started being able to have really uh, impactful conversations with companies. So based on starting and running the fellows program, um, we actually expanded into two other buckets of programming too. Um, our company coaching, where we go in and help companies to revamp their policies and practices um, to look at their outreach and vetting, uh, to train their managers on how to manage a diverse workforce, to work on retention and advancement. Um, and then also our work with students expanded. Because what we found was that while about 40% of students in our early applicant pools were passing the technical screen, which meant that they had the technical chops to do the work, only about 10% were getting offers from companies. And some of that was the way companies were approaching uh, the interview process, but some of it was that students didn't have exposure to how to show up um, and present themselves in a way that really sold their talents and abilities. Um, so we started a program called the Technical Applicant Prep Program, which works with students um, on those skills as well. Um, 
And the other thing that we realized is that about 80% of the students that go through uh, our programming each year say that they want to start their own companies. And while doing this work to change existing companies is important, starting to think about diversity and inclusion um, for new companies who are just starting out and can shape their cultures um, and start hiring in a way that creates these ripple effects is gonna be really impactful too. Um, so we have as well an entrepreneur in residence program um, where we work in this year in seven cities around the country uh, where we support an entrepreneur in residence who also um, helps to diversify their local tech community by sitting in a local tech hub, providing feedback and building bridges with the local diverse community. And actually next year, we're adding an eighth city um, to the residency program and that city is Atlanta. So um, we will be back here, so very excited about that. Um, so we had all of these uh, programs that we've been running and things that we've been learning and um, we realized this year in 2016 that it was really time to dive into a strategic planning process and start to understand um, not just what we're doing today and what impacts we're making today, but uh, where we see the organization um, in the year 2040, which we see as sort of our call to action year. Um, and really what that process helped us articulate is that um, we see tech and the tech sector um, not as the end goal, um, the end goal is not to diversify the tech sector, but as a means, as a way to close the wealth gap for black and Latino communities in the US. And um, that really when we're thinking about our work, we think about it as the economic thread of the 21st century civil rights movement that technology, because it is not just an industry growing so quickly, but infiltrating so many other industries. Um, I recently uh, heard the statistic that, um, I think it's 50% uh, of the um, uh, highest quartile paid jobs of the future will require coding of some kind. So technology is really infiltrating everything. Um, and if we want to ensure that communities of color have access to um, the type of economic opportunity that will help close that wealth gap, we have to be thinking about tech. Um, so what this did for us too was it sort of reframed the magnitude uh, of what we were thinking about and what we were, um, kind of the assumptions we were operating under and helped us reframe from um, sort of looking from today ahead at kind of the year over year growth impact and impacts we wanted to taking a step back and looking at what do we want the world to look like in the year 2040 and how do we back out from that? And instead of thinking about sort of a 10% uh, incremental growth, how do we think about sort of a 10X innovative um, growth? Um, and so this is now informing uh, kind of everything that we're doing and thinking about, um, all of the goals that the different teams are setting, um, how we're building infrastructure and systems, um, how we're leveraging technology ourselves. Um, but what it really helped us see too is that um, a big slice of this work, and I think this is um, sort of extremely timely and, and more relevant now, um, even than it felt uh, a week ago, that a big part of this is sort of hearts and minds work. Um, and uh, that there's really a um, sort of communications uh, and strategy component to it. Um, and it reminds me of, you know, in 2014, um, Google was the first company to release their diversity data. And before that happened, the conversation about diversity and technology was really abstract. And as soon as Google released their data, it became really concrete, really fast. And suddenly, um, seemingly overnight, uh, you know, I always describe it as, it felt like we were swimming upstream for the first two years from 2012 to 2014, and then suddenly the tide shifted and it felt like we were whitewater rafting. And that was a result of that, um, that data coming out. Um, and diversity in tech went from sort of a sometimes mentioned to a top three priority for most of the large tech companies um, in the Bay Area. And I think we're seeing that with, um, you know, narratives around uh, the importance of confronting racism and misogyny and xenophobia um, in real time now, that this is moving from sort of an abstract issue to a top 
three priority for the country. Um, and so that is a big part of how we're thinking about our work today. Cool. She's so dope. Um, I don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to uh, be on stage and to uh, sit next to a peer uh, that you look up to. Um, that is a really special thing to have in your life, uh, is to be surrounded by people who are in the same fight as you, but constantly give you uh, inspiration that things are gonna get better. Uh, and they're doing uh, such a big fight, and Laura has been that for me over the past couple years, and we've known each other. She is, uh, if you, she's given you a glimpse into her work, but uh, I hope you get a glimpse into her character, which is really what defines, I think, the success of, of Code 2040 and why she's uh, the Ed Cohen Award winner because of what she represents as a person, uh, not just as a CEO. So uh, I think, uh, you know, yes, get to know her model and how she does that work, but also get to know her as a person if you have the opportunity to do that. I think you'll become a better person because of it. Um, I am so proud uh, that Echoing Green is happening in Atlanta. Uh, it feels like a year ago I was screaming it, <laughs> and I was like, Atlanta, city of dreams, and uh, it's gonna happen, and it, it's happened, and what's amazing is the family that I grew up in, which is Atlanta, uh, is meeting my <laughs> new extended family that I've been married into. Uh, um, uh, don't tell my mom that, but there's a, uh, but the echoing green family, and it's, it's, a, it's people who uh, fight each and every day to make their relative communities better. Atlanta, we've been having this conversation for a long time, and we've been waiting for the world to listen, and they are listening. Uh, this is important, uh, that Atlanta is on the map for a conversation that we're responsible for having. Uh, but you can't just have a, uh, you know, talking about Atlanta as a great place for social justice work is a marketing exercise, uh, and that's great. Uh, but being authentic to social justice work, um, that's, a, uh, that's a values exercise. Uh, and I think some of the people you'll meet here in the city of Atlanta, they are so embedded in their values. They may not call themselves social entrepreneurs, but they are. Uh, and so many people get left out of these conversations about social entrepreneurship. And it's these folks in Atlanta that are here uh, that have been talking about this a long time. You just gave them a language to talk about it uh, with. And that's, that's powerful. Um, when my mom first came to the United States, uh, she took a one-way ticket from New Delhi, India to Chicago, Illinois. And she was there to go meet her knight in shining armor. Uh, my dad had uh, you know, a small studio apartment. I always laughingly say uh, he had two roommates, loneliness and a cockroach. Uh, and, uh, and it was rough. Like We were on the south side of Chicago, and, and when uh, you know, my dad tried to go to law school, got jumped on the street within the first few weeks of them being married, uh, was beaten, dragged, thrown into the apartment wrapped around a chair, and my, that's how my mom found him. And, uh, and my parents, they said, all right, when, when our son is born, when they knew I was gonna be born, they go, we're not gonna raise him here, we gotta get out of here. Um, they left. Um, they went back to India, and then within a few months, they were like, never mind, we're gonna come back uh, to the United States. Uh, but they said this time, we're gonna do things just, just a tad differently. Um, and what we did, my dad, he took a suitcase uh, and he took every little trinket he could find, <laughs> he threw it into a, a small suitcase uh, and saved up enough money for our, my parents to do their first trade, sh trade show in upstate New York. And we flew with our entire life savings inside of a suitcase. And we got, to, uh, <laughs> we got to New York, and I remember my mom and I were pacing back and forth, back and forth inside of our apartment waiting for my dad to get home. And uh, when my dad got home, he had, still had the suitcase in his hand. And we were like, damn it. This time was supposed to be different. It was, it was supposed to work out this time. And I, I, I'll never forget this day, my dad took the suitcase, he put it in front of my mom, he unzipped it, and there was nothing inside. And so we sold everything. There are a few moments in your life that, <laughs> that you just remember for the rest of your life. The first time you see your parents cry is one of those moments. And my dad and my mom, they're entrepreneurs. They don't call themselves that, but they are. And there it's important to be including those voices inside of these conversations. The work that Laura is doing is a exercise that we have to be a part of each and every day 
uh, which is an exercise of inclusivity. Diversity is an exercise of just putting people in a room together. Inclusivity is making sure that they have the power to make decisions about what it is that they're going to be doing for the rest of their life, and that that power is theirs and theirs alone, um, that they can fulfill their own destiny. And so for me, these conversations are really important, especially in a city like Atlanta that is at, the fork, at a fork in the road of popularity and authenticity. The Center for Civic Innovation exists uh, because we think this fight is so important and it's so local. We can, our presidents can change, but our, tomorrow the kids who don't have opportunity, they still don't have opportunity. This is a conversation we've been having at the local level for a long, long time. And we have to protect the work that's already happened. So this conversation, I really wanted to ground us in that, uh, in that number one, we are in a city that is built on these types of conversations. And you're not gonna see that inside of the Hyatt. You're gonna see it walking outside, on the street, where you have to walk by people um, and, and see what's going on in people's day-to-day -day lives. And the second thing I wanted to ground us in is, is the meaning of entrepreneurship. Uh, is, it's not about starting a business, it's about controlling your own destiny. And there's a two very, very different things. Um, and and that's, that's, I think, our mandate to figure out how do we include as many people as possible in that conversation. So, Laura, I'm lucky enough to, to be able to ask you a few questions on this, but I, I really want to get to the core of this um, because I think your perspective on this is so important. What are the limitations of data? Uh, I think there's a conversation going on just about 10 blocks that way about how data for social good is going to change the world. I challenge that, right? I, I'm worried about us, our over-reliance on data to, to give us as indicators of what needs to be as opposed to how we need to go about finding out what needs to be. How do you deal with that in a world that is so enriched in data, uh, yet is, is you're fighting a social justice issue with data. How do you do that? I think, you know, it's, there's an opportunity with data. It, data is a language that really speaks to some people, and some of those people are in power. And being able to leverage data and speak that language um, is sometimes what it takes to get what you need to do the work. Um, but it doesn't mean that it's the end goal. And I think one of the challenges, particularly um, as a social entrepreneur and when starting something, is a lot of times you don't have the data at the beginning. Um, and what you really need to do is, um, is learn and iterate, take things on faith, and find other people who will take things on faith um, and who will believe in you and your ability to um, combine your access to that data and information with your gut and your experience um, and move forward using all of the tools in the toolbox. I think data for me is a really amazing tool to shine light, particularly on inequities. Um, I was speaking um, at South by Southwest um, on a social entrepreneurship panel and there was a, a black woman who stood up and was really angry about um, the fact that we were talking about uh, diversity in tech using this data because it made her feel like a statistic. And I really felt like there's such um, validity in that view for the individual, but it's really problematic as a society if we can't talk about patterns and trends because that's what highlights systemic injustice as opposed to individual experiences. So I think it's hard because data can be cold, but it also can be necessary to provide context for what otherwise can feel like a fluke or an individual experience. Um, and there's a lot, particularly when you're talking about issues around equity and inclusion, it's really easy to write off an individual experience because there's no counterfactual. I don't know how my life would be different if I were white or male. Um, but I can point to data and show real disparities in outcomes for folks along demographic lines. Um, so it's a really tough balance, but I think as cold as it is, it's necessary in telling the story. Do, do you find that in a time like right now uh, where we've literally been, we have found a way with the way that information travels and the way information is used today, we've stopped trusting everything, right? There are, there are, uh, journalists who have spent their entire life uh, doing one piece of work and they 
can be uh, put down in the span of a second. A lifetime of work can be put down. The data that they ca gather can be put down uh, on a confirmation bias, right? To be able to say, look, I'm going to find the data that proves what it is that I want to hear. And in working in government, way too often you see leaders who, instead of using data to make decisions, they go out to find the data they need in order to justify the decision that they already made. So how do we get people to trust data again as something that is an indicator versus using it as a tool to uh, confirm what it is that you already believe? I think this is speaking to um, the importance of the source. And this is something that also I think is really timely as we're in the middle of a conversation about um, how you understand sources and how you um, kind of verify where information is coming from on the internet these days. Um, so I don't know that I have like a great answer for that, except that um, there are, it is really easy to um, manipulate data to find the data that says why you want to, whatever you want it to say. Um, I mean, this is why, um, you know, when studies are conducted, you have to say who funded them. Um, and I think it's equally important as a lot of us get our news and information from uh, the internet where things are retweeted and forwarded and reposted and um, I may see a story that's posted by a friend of mine and assume it's valid because I know and like that friend, um, but that friend isn't the person who wrote that story. And so I think we need to think really long and hard about what the obligation is of um, the sources for delivering that information. And for me, this really comes back to the conversation about why, um, why diversity in technology is important. Um, there's the economic equity aspect. There's also the fact that these, uh, the people who are making decisions about the platforms that mediate the way we spend most of our time interacting and the way we get most of our information today don't actually represent the population. And I think this is important now, but when you start to think about things like artificial intelligence where algorithms are baked in at the beginning and then the machine learns without you, it's all the more critical that the people who are creating those algorithms and making those choices are counteracting the bias that we're seeing that's really rampant in a lot of the technology that we use today. Have you found, I, and I'm not sure if this is something that you've solved yet, but it sounds like you're closer than some of us are, which is, have you found that you've been able to convince people to focus on the outcome versus the output? Um, because a lot of times our relationship, whether it's with funders, investors, the conversation is on the output. How many people showed up to your event? How many people uh, you know, looked like this in the room? Versus the outcome, which is the change in the actual industry that you're trying to affect. You talk a lot in outcomes, but is there, do you still feel trapped in this output game, which is, look, I'm gonna give you the data you essentially want to hear because that's what you're asking for, even though it might be distracting into the world that I'm trying to create. How do you find that balance as an entrepreneur? You know, this is one of the things that makes me feel really fortunate to be based in San Francisco and Silicon Valley. Um, there's a real um, mindset there around um, solving big problems and trusting the entrepreneur. And I, you know, I think there are absolutely downsides to kind of the culture and um, the celebritization of entrepreneurs and um, a lot of downsides to uh, sort of the culture out there, but this is a place where I feel like it's really actually useful in doing this work, um, is our funders care about the outcome and they trust us. And so the amount of times that I'm asked for that type of output data that feels like uh, a step along the way or sort of uh, at times sort of irrelevant or orthogonal or the thing you thought that you were gonna do that you needed to measure turns out to be really different than the thing that you actually need to do once, um, once you start doing the work. I felt a huge amount of freedom with our funders to play and experiment and iterate and learn in that way. Um, and some of that is, I mean, Echo and Green is a great example of that type of funder. Um, some of it is also having earned revenue. So at Code 2040, we're a nonprofit, but we have an earned revenue model. 
And when, for the revenue that we earn, it's totally unrestricted. We can spend it how we think we need to to meet the mission. Um, and so a big part of our focus is growing our earned revenue, partnering with funders um, who ensure that we have the ability to kind of make the de have as opposed to being beholden to a grant agreement that we signed 18 months ago. Do you find it different to talk about your work? I, I mean, I think it's sometimes feel, you sometimes feel crazy as an entrepreneur that you have to yell about a social justice issue in economic term, terms. That the only way someone's gonna listen to you about a issue of inequity is if it makes financial sense to their bottom line. And that's not just businesses, right? There's one thing to say your business could change your, your stream and the way that you do things on a day-to-day -day basis, but the same goes for government. We're finding that if you can't save government money or you can't uh, help them earn new revenue, maybe their value proposition of your work, the social justice is not enough of a value proposition to investors in this work. So how do you balance that? You're, you are working on a social justice issue, but it sounds like the, the value proposition is economic. I mean, would, would the, for, I won't call names, but like would the top five tech companies care about diversity if it wasn't hurting their bottom line? We get asked a version of that question a lot, which is like, how do you talk about this work? Is it moral? Is it economic? Um, and, you know, I think what you're pointing out is right. Um, like companies, as a, a whole, sort of in their in the sense of like corporate personhood, like they care about their bottom lines, like they exist to make profit. Um, that's not the motivation of every individual who's working in or leading those companies, however. Um, and so we have a lot of different versions of the conversation about why diversity, inclusion, equity in tech is important, both to the industry, to the country, um, to uh, the individual company that we're talking to, and sometimes that is an economic argument. Um, one of the interesting paradoxes there, though, is um, if it's really reduced to an economic argument, this is better for your bottom line. And, you know, we can make those arguments about recruiting costs and not competing for the same talent everyone else is and the innovation and uh, the increased shareholder value that, you know, studies have proven. Like, we can make all those arguments but one of the challenges there is that reduces this issue to being something um, that you can trade off with something else that impacts the bottom line. So um, maybe you uh, cut costs in another way or change your suppliers and that impacts your bottom line. And so you can do that instead of caring about diversity if what you're aiming for is to impact your bottom line. So what we've really found is it's important to show people um, that there is gonna be a positive economic impact because ultimately that's what a lot of folks are responsible for when they're working at or running a company. It's equally important to show people why this is a qualitatively different issue that is not interchangeable with cutting costs or boosting profits. So uh, we are at uh, historic lows around, around engagement in this, in this country. Uh, I think the US has a 72 year low on voter turnout right now. Uh, and uh, only 14% of people in the city of Atlanta, for example, voted in the last mayoral race, uh, meaning 86% of people stayed home. And I wish that was just the narrative for Atlanta because then we could target and focus on that. Uh, but that is the narrative across the United States in all 20, the top 25 metro booming neighborhoods. I didn't say metro booming just because I'm in Atlanta. <laughs> uh, but uh, that uh, it, th it, this is happening all around the country. Is there a responsibility for the people who are working on and having the conversations around building smart cities to start using those same tools uh, to have conversations on building equitable ones? What is the role of a rising technology community in making sure that the city that they live, breathe, and thrive in, such as the one you're in, uh, is equitable for the people who live there, uh, even if there is a new influx of people who are moving there? I think this is one of the reasons why um, I was so excited at Code 2040 for us to start doing more work outside of the Bay Area. Um, and I think this is sort of a, a healthy debate that we have a lot internally. On the one hand, you have the vast majority of um, the largest, most impactful tech companies in the world concentrated in the Bay Area. Um, on the other hand, most of the work that we do there is with people. 
Um, we're talking about companies that are quite large or growing quickly where their founding teams are set, their workforces are set, and changing ratios um, at that size is really difficult and changing cultures uh, is even harder, I would argue. Um, and sure, there's a lot of kind of new economic activity and new companies being started, um, but the ecosystem is really entrenched. And when you start to talk about um, the tech ecosystems that are popping up in other cities like Atlanta that are growing quickly that have uh, diverse communities to pull from right there, um, a real opportunity for those ecosystems to start out being more equitable and inclusive and not have the same problems and challenges that um, Silicon Valley and the Bay Area have. Um, and I think approaching it as um, kind of building the innovation and the economy and keeping it equitable is actually what gives some of these other ecosystems the opportunity to frankly leapfrog um, ahead of where we see existing tech ecosystems in the next you know, five, 10, 25 years. Um, you know, I come back to, again, 2040, um, that there's a real, very real demographic shift that this country is undergoing. And if companies are not able to attract and recognize and retain diverse talent, those companies are going to wither and die. Um, they're not gonna be able to hire people and retain people. They're not going to be able to sell their product to the consumer base of the future. Um, so, uh, again, you know, this is uh, a little bit more of an existential economic argument, but um, I really think it's a survival imperative for companies. Any company that's not thinking about it that way, um, are, we sort of feel like, okay, more power to you. Like, you know, you're going to disappear, and the companies that are figuring this out now, and frankly, the ecosystems that are figuring this out now are the ecosystems that are going to thrive in the future. So that, I think, is a real opportunity for folks outside of the Valley. Well, we're going to open it up uh, for some questions, if you're cool with that. Yeah. You don't have to be. You can leave. I, it's all good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm out. I'm Two rules around questions. Uh, if uh, One, uh, questions end with question marks. Um, so that would be great. Um, and then the, uh, the second, uh, second thing would be just introduce yourself uh, and who you are. Uh, that, that would just like, hi, my name is so-and-so. And if you're a fellow, say you're a fellow. If you're from Atlanta, just say you're from Atlanta. Uh, but just questions end with question marks. So let's keep to that. We'll get as many of these as we can. Uh, hi, my name is Lauren Carson. Um, my question is surrounding your questions, your response about strategic planning and some of the factors that kind of went into that. If you could also speak a little bit to your scalability uh, or your scaling and replicating throughout the different cities and even deciding to come to our wonderful city of Atlanta next year, if you could just talk a little bit about some of the factors and data that have kind of gone into that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so um, part of what we did with uh, the strategic planning process um, was kind of flip on its head our starting point in terms of how we wanted to think about our impact. Um, so not looking at um, how much do we think we can grow now, but what needs to happen actually externally, irrespective of Code 2040, in order to create the change that we want to see. And um, so what we did is we did a real sort of back of the envelope calculation about what would it look like to see proportional representation for black and Latinx folks in the tech industry in the year 2040. Um, and of that, uh, so, you know, looking at what's the growth of the industry, what's the growth of the population, um, some simple math there, and um, then what portion of those folks do we think that we need to touch or impact in some way um, in order to see the type of equity in the industry that we want to see. Um, and so uh, th these numbers are approximate, which I think just proves that this is really an order of magnitude conversation, but it's something like we need to touch in some way 6 million people by 2040. Um, and so we don't think that we need to be linear between now and then. Um, so I think we came to something like a quarter million in 2025 and about 40,000 in 2020. But the really key insight there was when you start to talk about numbers like that, um, Code 2040 worked with about 1,000 individuals in the last year. Um, you can't do more of the same to get from 1,000 to 40,000 in three years. 
you have to totally re-examine what impact looks like and um, what different types of impacts are needed to achieve your goal. Um, so we started to look at the work that we were doing through these three lenses. Um, what's the direct service work? Um, so what is it where we're standing in front of somebody, um, putting them through a program, having an impact? What's the scale service work? So what is it that we do where uh, if 5, 10, 15, 50 people take part, um, it's roughly the same amount of cost per effort. But then also what's the multiplier effect that we're looking for? So what does it look like to actually think about our alumni network as folks who are going to go out and make change on their own um, because they've been catalyzed by their experience with us? What does it look like to um, be more intentional, more intentional about um, our writing and speaking so that we are putting a theory um, of the world out there that people can embrace and adopt and use to shape their own work. Um, and so we actually then went through and broke down what are the different pieces of our different programs that are direct and scaled and multiplier and what's the ratio that we need so that we can create the impact that we want but also sustain the learning that we need um, to keep growing. So the fellows program is very expensive um, but it actually informs uh, much of what we do because of the huge amount of learning that we get from it. So it's money very well spent, whereas we may spend very little on um, the multiplier effect work, but uh, have much lighter touch for many more people. Um, so that's how we sort of thought about that. That exercise can help you cut programs as well that just aren't hitting, especially in a time right, right now where we've got to ask ourselves, are we actually making the impact or are we just talking about it? We've almost created an entire industry around uh, just supporting uh, things that don't work <laughs> rather than focusing in on things that, that do. So thanks for that. Susan. Hey, Laura. Uh, Tony, 2016 fellow and Atlanta person. Um, my, I did some reading and from what I read, I, I saw something that said that the more diverse uh, the tech industry gets, uh, people uh, claim that it loses its prestige. Like when it when it was a very like non-diverse industry, people who could code were seen as like unicorns or like magicians. But now that people of color and women are getting more access to it, that sort of level of prestige, people are starting to view it differently. Has that been the case in your experience? It's a really interesting point. And when we started out, um, actually one of the core things that we knew we needed to do was to create an extremely prestigious program um, because we needed to send the message that black and Latino talent was not discount talent or less talented talent, um, but was equally if not more qualified than the folks who were um, doing these jobs at the time. About our brands, about our messaging, um, we kept the program really small at the beginning while we iterated on our own admissions criteria to be sure that um, we could uh, show up and impress anybody who interacted with um, our fellows. Um, that said, I think that uh, we're now at a time where um, coding in particular is becoming uh, more commonplace. Um, so there's a huge movement, computer science for all, to get coding, uh, computer science education in every classroom in the US. We're seeing that happen um, in New York City, in Chicago, where every public school child will get computer science education. Um, so coding itself is becoming uh, sort of the fourth R, except it starts with C. Um, but is uh, the idea is to make it um, just something that everyone gets exposed to. I think the um, challenge moving forward is that um, coding is not the same as being able to actually um, build new platforms and products, launch companies, be the entrepreneur. Coding is a skill and it's useful, but it's not, um, it's not gonna solve everything. And so my um, concern now is that there's the potential for there to be another um, sort of stratification where uh, like if you are low income or in a community of color, um, you learn a single coding language and you have some basic skills, but you don't have kind of the broader theoretical um, computer science, computational thinking, um, the ability to actually like build the algorithms that we're talking about that are gonna be shaping the future. Um, so I think that is where we need to do the most work now.
Smith, um, Labor X 2014 fellow. Uh, so to your question, or to the first question on how we get to full representation by 2040, I am very skeptical that our traditional systems, so our universities are really serving our communities in uh, big enough numbers to really get us there. So if companies pull from these pipelines, uh, and when you have 68% of working age Americans who don't have a college degree, in your work, when you think about non-traditional talents, those being served, maybe by the boot camps that are only teaching them one language and not the theoretical um, frameworks that they need to know, what are you hearing from companies? So this is the work I'm in, and I feel like maybe where you were three years ago is kind of what I'm hearing, like, oh, they're not, you know, the pipeline's not there, the quality's not there, but people are being educated by many different ways now. So what role does the non-traditional student have? Can yeah. you Part of what we have had the opportunity to do, which is part of what we're working on scaling, is actually um, help companies to challenge their assumptions about where talent comes from. Um, so we have a group of companies um, that we uh, have pulled together who've worked with Code 2040 for a couple years, who based on kind of that data that I was talking about, um, earlier have agreed to throw out their entry-level hiring process and build it uh, from the bottom up because they've seen now that it's not actually working the way they thought it was. And in some of those companies, we've convinced them to do things like um, go totally university blind. So they don't actually see where a student has gone to school or if a student has gone to uh, a four-year college or university when they're evaluating uh, the candidacy. Um, and I think more and more we're going to need to help um, companies and companies are going to need to push themselves to understand um, the difference between the skills that they are looking for and the proxies that they've been using to identify those skills. Um, and for a very long time, uh, university and particularly brand name universities have been a proxy for other things like do you work well in teams? Um, have you been socialized about how to show up at the office? Um, have you taken certain courses um, that we believe are fundamental? Things that may correlate with what an individual is required to do on the job, but certainly it's not a one-to-one -one correlation, and there are other ways to assess for those sorts of skills and experiences. Um, and companies historically have not used those other ways or pushed themselves to see beyond kind of those proxies. So a big part of the conversation that we have with our partners is drilling down when we do that company coaching, what is it that you're actually looking for and what are you using as a proxy to get to it? And if it's a proxy, throw it out and find a way to actually measure what a person needs to do once they get on the job because a lot of those things are extraneous and they create totally unnecessary barriers to entry for a lot of folks, particularly from low-income communities and communities of color. Um, I think that concludes our question and answer uh, session. Um, I'd like to close with one last question. Uh, in when uh, when Laura walks into a room, what's the theme song that plays? Uh, I would love to hear that and why. Um, it would be great. Um, you know, I think it's probably um, like the breakdown part in Crazy in Love where you yeah. get to do the like, <laughs> that is, yeah, that's it. Just that on a loop. We'll see more of that on Thursday, so that's good. Can y'all join me in thanking Laura? Cool. Can you give them another hand, please?